So did you look at, so, so you were looking at the mice overall, right? The, this was the effect on the mice. Did you look uh, kind of at, at any of the, the effects within the mice? So d did you see reduced inflammation in particular? We, we did see reduced inflammation, you know, basically doing a, a panel of inflammatory factors, especially mm. in the females. We saw that there was, was, was an effect there. Um, and that, you know, that's always a chicken and egg. You know, is that causal to the effects we see on pathologies and, you know, coat color and all the other things we saw? Or is that really a, a, a readout of the fact that we've slowed an aging process that, that's underneath inflammation in some way? Uh, I mean, everywhere we turn in the aging literature, inflammation is there. And I think that there's very good evidence that aging drives, of course, there's good evidence. It drives pathology of many, many diseases. But the rate of inflammation itself, is it governed by something else? Uh, and, you know, I, I think about cellular senescence, obviously, mm -hmm. and, you know, the work from Judy Campisi and many others who are showing that cellular senescence, which you could think of as a, like a normal aging mechanism, it's something that happens during normal aging, mm -hmm. but that drives up inflammation and that leads to the advancement of pathology, pathology of disease. So yes, we saw elevated inflammation, uh, sorry, we saw suppression of inflammation with AKG. Um, we're not confident that that's the causal mechanism necessarily. Right, but it, okay. But we, we think it, the AKG may have reduced the inflammation. because that, Absolutely, yes. Okay, because that, yes, it's like, as you, as you say, it's very, very important, especially for NAD levels, because it seems to drive, um, CD38. And yes, yes. Yes. So I, another, so did you look, um, does, does AKG support like ammonia detoxification? Is this something that you were, uh, you looked at at all? Did you say ammonia detox? Yeah, ammonia. Oh, uh, no, we did not look at that. No, we no. didn't look at that. Okay. No, I mean, it, it's, there's just, it's just one of those things where there are so many interesting ways to follow up. I, I mean, I think mm -hmm. that some people in my lab right now are, are interested in the epigenetic mechanisms because there are cofactors for enzymes involved in epigenetics. And, and so actually, and this, this happens a lot, we do these experiments in the mice, it throws up lots of possibilities. And then we go back to the worm to ask the more mechanistic questions. You know, almost like if, if we have confidence that we've hit a conserved mechanism between worm and mouse, then of course the easiest system to do the quick experiments is back in the, in, in the worm. So right. that, that's that's currently what we're doing. Interesting. I also should say, and this is um, um, very consistent with what we see with other aging interventions, is that we see protection against uh, protein change, uh, proteostasis, advancement mm -hmm. of proteostasis with AKG. And this is unpublished, but, but essentially we're seeing that it protects against um, an, an amyloid beta toxicity model in the worm, uh, where, where the... the the expression of human amyloid beta causes the worms to get sick. And we almost always see protection in that model with agents that extend lifespan. And it, it kind of speaks to this common common cause idea that, that you know, that the, the thing that's making the, let's just take the coat color in the mouse. Hmm. So the, the coat color is, is, you know, becomes grayer. You see uh, patches of, of, you know, open skin where the hair has fallen out. Um, the AKDG treated mice are, don't exhibit those um, characteristics as fast. <laughs> so they look great. I mean, they, you know, and everyone gets excited when you look at the photograph of the gray mice and the black mice. Uh, now, so there's, there's hairs. Now, worms don't have hairs, um, but you go back to the worm and you see protection against things like protein homeostasis change or a beta toxicity, mm. which seems, how, I mean, how can they possibly connect it, be connected? And, and I think this is something that the entire field is, is testing right now is what's the interconnectedness of aging mechanisms to different pathologies. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'll give you another quick example of a, a compound that came out of worm studies. And this was a compound called thioflavin T that we, we mm. published a number of years ago, extended lifespan. It also promoted protein homeostasis. It prevented A beta toxicity. And, and over the years, we've been doing various mouse studies, and principally, we want to mention one with Simon Melov, who published this uh, a couple of months ago, showing that a very similar compound to thioflavin T, a more slightly more drug-like compound, protected against bone loss 
in a mouse. Bone loss. Mm. Now, this is a this is a, this was found in worms, and it's protecting against bones. And worms don't have bones. Mm-hmm. And then in the lab next door, uh, Julie Anderson's lab here at the back, and she won't mind me mentioning very preliminary data, um, uh, showing that this same compound protects against uh, Parkinson's disease in, in mouse models as well. And you kind of stand back from all of this. Uh, if you, again, if you don't mind, like thinking about AKG and thiot. These are things that were found in in vertebrate model systems. They've been brought into the mice and we're seeing protective effects in bone, skin, and brain. And the only way that that makes sense in my mind is that these compounds are are hitting universal aging mechanisms. And in, in a sense, again, it's a hypothesis, in a sense that whatever pathology you then look at after this intervention, you're going to see benefits. Right. Yes. Okay. So just one last uh, kind of question on this there, on AKG. Did, so did you look at growth hormone, wh- whether AKG promotes or helps with growth hormone? No, no, we haven't done that in any definitive way. No. No. Okay. But very, again, very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'd like to stick in with AKG, but getting a bit more practical. So mm. what dose did you give the mice? And, and oh. you have, if you thought about a human equivalent? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I dearly wish my PhD student was on this call to give you that answer. <laughs> now, now you've revealed that I'm the worm guy and uh, the Azar Shumera, as I should have mentioned her name, is, is, is the mouse person here. Um, I mean, we obviously looked at the mouse literature in AKG and made, made a, a, a... These are difficult decisions because these are expensive experiments, of course, uh, to mm. decide on those. And, um, and sometimes we're actually faced with going back to the worm and asking, well, if this dose works in the worm, what would the equivalent be in the mouse? And therefore, what would the equivalent be in humans? And um, I mean, I think, I think people are thinking carefully about not just the dose, but the form of AKG, because it can be delivered with diff- different salts mm-hmm. and also in different combinations. And uh, there's a company out there uh, called Ponce de Leo who actually funded uh, much of the research at the buck on, on the mouse models. Um, are actively pursuing that right now is to, you know, what's the dose, what's the formulation, what's the combinations with, with other potential um, agents that, that may be beneficial in the aging space. So um, I, I can't wait to see what, what they come up with. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.